Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, to the Innovate uh, 3D uh, webinars with uh, with uh, uh, CATI. My name is Howard Rett. I'm the product manager for the X1 Metal Design Lab system. Uh, we're excited to be partners with CATI. Um, they're certainly leaders in their field, and, and we're we're pleased to be uh, to be with them. So I'd like to spend the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes. I just want to give you a brief introduction, talking a little bit about um, the Metal Design Lab system, um, and uh, introduce you to the technology, and uh, and then I'm going to uh, open up to we'll open the floor to a a, a brief uh, brief Q and A session. And then I'm going to uh, hand it over to Peter Denmark, who's my colleague. Um, so just to go through the agenda real quick, um, I want to give everybody just so that we all have the same baseline. Uh, some of you may understand or may know what metal injection molding is, but I think it's worthwhile to just give a brief uh, one or two slide introduction so that everyone is on the same um, at, uh, at the same baseline. Um, and then I'll just dive right into it. We'll go into a uh, a uh, overview of the metal design lab, talk about the consumables, the materials that pass through the system to get you your metal parts. Uh, and then I'll do a slight comparison so that uh, to give you, it's, it's more of a segue going into Peter's uh, presentation. Um, so, you know, some of you may, may or may not be familiar with these kinds of technologies. So the metal design lab, we're using uh, an extrusion, um, a liquefied extrusion filament. So it works very much like an XYZ printer. Uh, binder jet systems work like a, uh, are, are rasterized, so they work a lot like, I'm going to very much oversimplify the term, but very much like a, like an inkjet printer. So you're spraying multiple nozzles at the same time. So they're, they're different technologies. So I'll do a very slight material comparison and then do a, a quick case study and then summarize. So uh, about me, again, I, I think is, I've already mentioned I'm the product manager. Um, Heather mentioned that also. Um, I've spent a number of years in CAD CAM CAE PLM. Um, I've worked for many of the, the larger companies, Siemens, PLM, SolarWorks, and PTC, and I've also spent a number of years in additive manufacturing. I worked at Stratasys for a number of years, and I was also with uh, Z Corporation, which was uh, consumed by um, uh, by 3D Systems. So I, I, I have quite a bit of uh, experience in um, in sand additive as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. I like to I like to have a, a sort of a you know, kind of a mission statement so that we all kind of have the same baseline in terms of, you know, what people, what is it that we're trying to do here um, with the Metal Design Lab? And so I say it's, it's uh, we want to provide an easy, affordable, office-friendly 3D printing solution for, for true, what we call print today, parts tomorrow from metal parts. Um, most of you are already familiar with 3D printing. Some of you may have, um, you know, systems in house and whatnot, um, but, the 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 um, the objective of uh, of the metal design lab system is to is to be able to get parts in your hand quickly. So with that, let's talk a little bit about the MIM process. MIM stands for metal injection molding. And uh, if you want to find out more about this technology or this method of manufacture, if you're not already familiar with it, um, you can just do a Google search on MIM or metal injection molding. There's there's some great websites that have a lot of detailed information in which I pulled some of this information from off, uh, off of myself. Um, but if you think of the injection molding process, most people understand what that is. You have a, a, a thermal plastic, you liquefy it through a heated nozzle, and then you inject that into a mold cavity. And then uh, you separate that mold cavity, which gives you your finished part. So the first half of the MIM process actually mimics that of the injection molding process. But instead of using a thermal plastic, we use metal powder instead, and that metal powder is held together with a binder. So we take that metal powder and we combine it with the binder, and then that material is, is what's called feedstock. So the feedstock you can kind of think of as it being your uh, your thermal plastic that you that you would inject into your mold cavity. Um, once your part is formed, you have what's called a green part. You have to go through with what's called a debinding process, which means that you have to remove the plastic or the binder material that's holding the metal together so that the part retains its shape, um, which, which then in turn gives you a brown part, which then you center. And the centering process, I'll talk about that briefly in the next slide, but the centering process is applying heat uh, just below the melt temperature of the metal that you're trying to, uh, that you're trying to center enough so that you bond the adjacent small spherical uh, 
powder particles together to form a solid metal part. With, um, with 3D printing, uh, using this technology, we cut out a lot of these steps. Um, the biggest that of which is, is uh, having to go through the injection molding process, the tooling that's required and so forth. And really what we do is we just start off with the, um, with the metal design lab system from X1. We just start off with the feedstock, which is a liquid, which is a liquefied material. If you think of toothpaste, that's the consistency that, that that's what the actual feedstock is like. It's, it's basically a toothpaste like material that consists mostly of metal powder that's suspended. Um, that's in a suspension. Uh, we take that metal powder and then we 3D print your part and then we just send it to the sintering furnace. Um, it's a two step process and you can have parts in as little as two days or less. So, um, what is the sintering process? Um, this is a nice slide I like to throw up. Um, it shows on the left hand side a pre sintered part, it shows on the right hand side a fully sintered part. And essentially, if you, if you look at and this is the, the, the uh, powder particles, by the way, are, are not the scale. Um, typically, what you get when you have the when you use the MIM process is this, this shrinkage uh, associated with it. So your 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 part will actually get smaller. Um, but in this particular case, um, you essentially, essentially you're applying heat, and then the, and, and then the heat is what pulls the uh, the metal powder uh, spheres together, which gives you which uh, solidifies into a solid part. So the metal design lab system. Um, it's a it's a two unit system. There's a there's a very busy slide, but um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because there's just a few takeaways that I want you to note, and I've highlighted them in green for your convenience. Um, but essentially, it's a two step system. So as I mentioned before, if you want to go from a CAD model to a part that you're holding in your hand, um, you can do it in as little as two days. And you start by printing the part, and then when the part comes out of the printer, you put it into the sintering furnace. And then when the sintering cycle is done, uh, you take your part out and uh, you start using it. Um, we use, uh, as I mentioned before, Hydrofuse is, is the trademark name that we have, <coughs> excuse me, for our consumable. And there's two, uh, we have two materials that we have, um, uh, that we currently offer. Uh, it's 17.4 pH and 316 L. Uh, those are both stainless steels. Um, and, um, and once the uh, uh, once the part has been uh, printed, it can go right into the furnace, the sintering furnace, which is the uh, which is the device on the right hand side. Um, and one of the other advantages of this system is that, unlike other unlike our competitors, other other uh, unlike other systems that that uh, use this this type of uh, printing te technology, um, because we use so little binder, um, we can have fully thick solid parts. So. If you have a part that has, let's say it's got a 30 millimeter or 50 millimeter wall thickness, you can have a fully thick solid part using this technology because we, we use so little binder um, during the, uh, the printing, uh, during the printing process. And all of this uh, is under $200,000. The printer itself um, essentially has a shoebox size print volume. It's just shy of eight inches by 11 by six. Um, it prints at the rate of about uh, just shy of two and a half cubic inches per hour, um, and it has 1% dimensional accuracy. The printer itself actually has very high accuracy. It's, an, it's micron level XY accuracy and plus or minus one micron in the Z direction. So it's extremely, extremely accurate. Typically with the, with the MEM process, the shrinkage winds up, um, winds up uh, erasing some of, some of that accuracy um, in, in, in terms of um, uh, the dimensional accuracy, but we guarantee plus or minus 1%. So what that means is that if you print the part that's a, let's say it's a hundred millimeter square, then you're guaranteed to have between 99 and 101 millimeter uh, every time you print. So that's actually pretty good for, for using this kind of technology. The X1F is a vacuum uh, advanced furnace. Um, it has been designed to, to be used in, uh, you know, we, we use that term office friendly very loosely. Um, you, you, you could certainly bring it in the, in the office like environment. You know, if you have a shop, you can plug it into the wall. Uh, it's a, it's a electrical furnace. Um, it uses single phase power 220 to 240. Um, there's a single exhaust line, 3 quarter inch, uh, that comes out of the back to, to exhaust off the, uh, uh, 
um, the evaporative support. Um, so there's actually two materials in the system that that is a dual print head system. So you can print the the metal material, and then you would print uh, support material, which could either be metal and or uh, evaporative. So so that uh, during the sintering cycle, that material is uh, gets burned off. Um, and we also use an argon gas supply um, in order to uh, to eliminate the oxidation that occurs during the sintering process. The system has an extremely easy to use 10 inch touchscreen. Um, you power the system on. You can actually see the little power button on the uh, on the just on the bottom of the uh, to the uh, bottom of the touch display on the right hand side. You power the system on. The uh, the computer boots up, and essentially you have two options to choose the materials of which you want to center. And the sintering cycles are less than 16 hours each. So once you tap that button to indicate what material that you have in the furnace you're trying to center either 14 or 16 hours later, respectively of the material that you've chosen, you'll have a fully centered, fully dense uh, metal part uh, northward, north of 90, uh, 97% uh, uh, density. Um, you can see the sintering temperatures up uh, are certainly for ferrous alloys. And the, the sintering chamber is a, is a cylinder. Um, it's essentially, it's, it's a little more than nine inches in diameter and just about a foot deep. So it can certainly accommodate any size part that you build either whole or if you're, or if you're doing multiple parts, uh, where you can also have multiple shelf configurations or uh, single shelves. The consumables themselves, I talked about them a little bit and the workflow, but essentially, um, you know, competitors, uh, you know, have a, have a three-step process uh, which means that you need to print, you need to debind and center, which if you go back to the slide that I had uh, illustrated earlier in the presentation, it very much mimics that process. It, it mimics the MIM process. But, you know, we really don't need the debind uh, process because we use water in the place of a lot of the binder that uh, that our competitors use. And uh, and so as a result of that, we just has a we have a very simple two-step process, as I mentioned before. You print it and you center it. The consumables, um, and this is really kind of the, the special sauce of this technology, if you will. This is what really differentiates us. If you compare by weight per unit volume of consumable material, you have 90% metal powder, 10% water, and less than 1% binder. And what that means is that during the printing process, that water is evaporated off. So by weight, you have 99%, you have 99% metal powder that's printed into the shape of your part. And actually, I have a, a green part on my desk here. I'm not sure if you can you can see that, but this is printed on the raft. You can actually see the quality of it's pretty good. And and this is there there's very there's less than 1% uh, binder material in this. Um so if this was you know maybe you know one or two or three inches thick um I could I could center that and then cut it in a bandsaw and the middle of it would be fully thick if, if I so chose. Um, the consumables themselves are, are these cartridges that are reusable. Uh, once you deplete them, you send them back to us. Uh, we re refill them and we send, send them back to you, or it doesn't have to be in that order. You can, uh, of course, you can order consumables uh, and then accumulate and send back empty cartridges uh, at your convenience. The, uh, there's three, the first three positions are for build material. Um, and then the last position, which is farthest to the left or the back of the machine is for the support material. And um, and you're only using because it's, as I mentioned before, it's a dual print head system. You're only using two cartridges at any given time. Here's a gallery of some of the parts that we've made. Uh, some of the parts that's in our uh, our demo gallery. You can see that we can do tooling for injection molding. Um, you can do extremely complex parts. The complexity, of course, comes for free using this kind of technology. And you can also finish the parts. There's a couple parts in there that have been uh, that have been buffed and and whatnot and pre-finished. So just very quickly to talk about um, using this technology versus going into binder jetting, which uh, my colleague Peter is going to talk about in just a couple of minutes. Um, by looking at uh, by looking at 316L stainless, uh, let's just do a quick comparison. If you go to um, if you go to x1.com, you'll you'll see that there is a uh, there's a material section that has uh, all of our materials, has all of our binders. And it has all the materials properties. So this is uh, what you would, if you go to x1.com, uh, you'll actually see 316L stainless. You can pull up this data sheet, gives you all of the relevant material properties. 
Um, because this is a, a relatively new uh, addition to, uh, to our portfolio, uh, we're still in the process of testing the materials. Um, and, um, but I just wanted to walk through uh, the microscopy of doing a, um, uh, of, of doing a, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, an X1 360, I, I'm sorry, a binary jet 316, which is on the left versus a, um, a 316 that's done on the metal design lab. Um, the, the next image I want to show is going to be a, a micros is going to be a microstructure comparison. Um, I want to, um, uh, I, I want to, um, uh, to, to predefine the image. That is, um, the thing that is important to note is the microstructure. Um, the, the image on the right, uh, even though it, it seems to have a lot of porosity, this wasn't actually centered in the X1F furnace. And so that's why you see the porosity there. But if you look past that, what you see is the grain structure, which by comparison on the left, you have very nice grain structure. So that's really the key. When we when we center the sample in, uh, in, in the X1F and we do a microstructure, it'll look a lot like the left-hand side. If we look at the me mechanical properties and we do a comparison, um, you can see ultimate tensile strength uh, on the BJ is binder jet. Uh, the, the RP is is from Rapidia. So Rapidia is our uh, is the manufacturer and provider of the metal design lab. So we actually uh, we are we are the sole supplier of this system, and so we work very closely with them. They've actually done their own testing. So the RP numbers are the numbers that they've come up with. And then uh, for our testing, you can see in green, those are the numbers that we've come up with. Um, and we, we've either, we've, we have either meet it or exceeded uh, the criteria. Um, the elongation, we simply didn't have a large enough sample, but we're, we're pretty confident that with the right sample that will easily achieve um, uh, the, uh, the 40 to 50% MPIF standard. So MPIF is the metal powder. It's a stand, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, um, uh, it's a lot, it's similar to, to an ASTM uh, light standard, um, but certainly with this technology, we meet or exceed um, the MPIF uh, standards. And just to wrap up, just a quick case study, um, University of British Columbia, uh, they have a metal design lab system and um, uh, they've been using it since, uh, since last year. They print 17.4 pH on it. And uh, you can see that the, uh, the parts that they have very unique, uh, high complexity, very difficult to make any other method uh, using any other method other than 3D printing. And of course, because they're using a metal design lab system, it's extremely cost effective. So to wrap it up, what are the key points of this system? It's office friendly. You can have parts the next day. And we use a simple, we use, uh, we use commonly, readily commonly uh, available argon gas. Um, and, uh, and your parts can be 100% uh, solid thickness um, for, for full strength. You know, one of the things that I talk about quite often is, uh, you know, we all know that when you're printing with, uh, uh, you know, with XYZ or, or filament or extrusion uh, type systems, um, that in order to, to increase or decrease your print time, or you know to lightweight your part, you can use uh, an infill, which you can see the part on the right hand side of that image. But what's important to know that's great if it's a plastic part, but if it's a metal part, um, that's that really doesn't work out that well. You know, most engineers, I would I would probably guess that most of you uh, have SolidWorks. Um, most of you have a package where you have the FEA software. Uh, FEA. FEA technology is is ubiquitous. Um, it's it's pretty easy to use. A lot of engineers adopt it. And if you design something using those tools, that when you you design it to that particular specification, when you make that part, you don't want you want to make sure that that part is the same part that you design and validate it in your CAD software. Uh, if you print the part out with infill, then you've completely invalidated that design. Competitive systems don't allow you to make parts with wall thicknesses greater than five millimeters without switching to infill automatically. So this is the only system that gives you truly, truly, truly thick parts upon your, uh, upon your demand. Today, we're gonna to talk about uh, metal binder jet additive manufacturing. So a brief agenda, we're gonna give a little history of X1, what our mission is, 
talk a little bit about the metal binder jet process, and discuss the differentiating technology from X1. We'll show you a couple of the systems, and then we'll end with some case studies. Um, a little bit of a background on me. Uh, my name is Peter Denmark. I'm the product manager for the metal binder jetting systems at X1. Um, I spent the first 10 years of my career in orthodontics, um, specifically looking at the digitization of dentistry. Um, and then realized I saw where all the manufacturing machines were coming from and jumped over into the additive industry, starting with Envision Tech, uh, worked at Ultimaker, and most recently, uh, Desktop Metal. I live just outside of Boston. And really want to show you who X1 is. Um, X1 has been around for about 26 years, more like 27 when you add in the thought behind it. But when you look at 1995 and being able to have the vision that Dr. Rhodes had of the MIT patents that were coming out for metal binder jetting, that was when it all really started. And in 1998 was when the first metal binder jetting system was made by X1 and sold to Motorola. Um, so you can see the hit deep history in the market of metal binder jetting that X1 has. And in 2005, the X1 lab was announced and put, it, put in production. And that is now the X1 InnoVent Plus that has been developed and refined over the last 15, 16 years. And in 2013 is when X1 went public. And the amount of enthusiasm around that was because of the single metal alloy. And before, X1 was printing in sands and composites and uh, infiltrated materials. But in 2013 is when single alloys started being printed. So your 17.4s, your 316s, uh, your stainless steels and uh, materials like that. And then it really started growing into the size of machines, so the scale of machines. So it started with an InnoVent, went to a 25 Pro, and then up to a 160 Pro, and now we'll be launching a newest system, the InnoVent Pro 3 liter and 5 liter at the end of this year. The vision of X1 is pretty simple, sustainable manufacturing without limitations. And that sustainable manufacturing is the green aspect of how we can recycle a lot of our powders. And without limitations, that means, you know, locally, local distributed manufacturing closer to where the consumer is going to be using that product and without limitations on materials. So we have the industry leading binder jet materials of 24 plus materials that are able to be done on an X1 machine. Um, and our mission is to develop and deliver those powerful 3D printing systems through our partners such as CATI. We really want to show you where our metal position is right now. And X1 is the only 3D printing company with a full range of printers that can go from R&D to full mass production. And we'll show you that lineup later. But we have the industry leading again, 20 plus materials. We have a very reliable accuracy and density um, that is repeatable. Um, and it's important to know that X1 has delivered over 10 metal systems to the market. That's not 10 metal printers, that's 10 systems that has been happening for over 23 years. And when you look at that quality and experience, that's where we fall on this on the map of our competitors. And that's really important to know that we've been building these machines and understanding the process of this, process of this for over 20 years. And we have a way for customers to adopt this process in a low risk environment. So now we're going to talk a little bit about just the metal binder jetting process. Similar to all 3D printing, it's going to start with a digital file. Everyone's pretty up to speed on what the digital file is, but there are DFAM possibilities for that. But then you're going to 3, then you're going to 3D print. We're going to build up layer by layer. Oh, geez, it keeps changing. Um, and then we're going to go into a curing step, a depowdering step, and then the final step of metal sintering. Now. The binder jetting process is the same through all technologies as far as laying down a thin layer of powder and then coming by with a print head and depositing that binder onto the powder. And wherever that binder adheres to the powder, you form what's called a green part. And then you do that process, rinse and repeat over and over again, laying a thin layer of powder, then you are spreading it, compacting it, and then you are ink jetting onto that what your bitmap of your CAD file is. 
And you do that however many layers are in the build, and then you have a green part that is ready for the next step in the process, and that is curing. So the curing of the part goes into an oven. It's going to be raised to about 400 degrees F. That's done to drive off the water or aqueous solution in the aqueous part of the binder and cross-link some of the polymer. And depending on part thickness, build size, build box depth, those can range in different hours, but it's part of the whole process. The next part of the process is the depowdering. Depowdering is the most labor intensive. This is where you're going to be um, excavating each green part out of, or brown part out of the um, build box and spraying with a little bit of powder, uh, air or brushing off the powder with a paintbrush. And then the last step is the curing step or the, the sintering step. So the, in the sintering step, you're going to be going into a furnace. X1 does not sell the furnaces, but we work closely with furnace manufacturers on the production side. For on the lower end, we have the M, the XF1 furnace that we can use with binder jetting as well. But what, what you're going to be doing in this process is actually consolidating the part into, a, um, into final densities. And when we talk about densities for uh, binder jet, it's, it's nice to compare to what the other techniques for metal forming are. And when you look at press and center, the densities are 85 to 93 percent, and that's okay for the application. A lot of things don't have to be fully dense, but you can feel confident that X1's densities are between 97 and 99 percent repeatedly on many alloys. Some alloys don't, don't need to get that dense, but on the alloys that do, we can get there. And when you compare it to below the line there, we're right in line with almost all of the traditional manufacturing processes when it comes to densities. Now, what makes X1 different? And when we talk about binder jetting, it is a simple process, but it has many inter interdependencies based on uh, the inputs. So you have print head, binder, powder, then you have machine controls and re recipes. We can dive into all of these pretty in depth, but I really want to pull out a few. And, and what it is, is is a print head. So in inkjet print heads, there's either two ways of, ink, of jetting the ink. They're either a piezoelectric print head or a thermal print head. Now the piezoelectric print head offers the widest range of materials of binders that can be put into that. And that's why X1 is a piezoelectric only uh, print head company. And then the second point is when you look at how you dispense the powder, spread the powder, and compact the powder, and print. X1, over the years, has understood that all of those are discrete functions and need to be separated. So we have a patented triple advanced compaction technology that allows us to spread the powders and dispense the powders, spread the powders, and compact the powders. Um, and that's what led us to over 24 plus materials in our process. So we have R&D qualified materials, customer qualified materials, and third party qualified materials. And how we break that down is, is third party materials, we can give the recipes, we can give the powders, we can give process settings, centering profiles on all of those materials and they're ready to go today. On the customer qualified materials, that means the customer has bought an X1 machine, they've developed their materials, and with our help, they've made that material viable for their application. And then in R&D qualified, because X1 machines are the most research machines in the world, there are tons of research papers on specific materials that were done on X1. If those are materials of interest, we can work with the process to bring that to production. And along with the powders, we also have the binders that interact with those powders and different, you know, low alloy steels, high alloy steels, nickels, stainless steels, reactives. So we have nanofuse, clean fuse, fluid fuse, and aqua fuse, and then phenol fuse as well. Um, but the diversity of, of materials matches up with the ver versatility of binders. And X1 is one of the only binder jetting companies that has multiple binders. So it's really important to understand that side of the process. And then we'll look at a little bit of the 3D printers. Um, this is our lineup. So from the far left, that's the InnoVent Plus. In the middle is the 25 Pro. On the far right, we have the 160 Pro. And the little guy down there, that's the, our AGV, our robot that goes in and moves build boxes between processes on the 160 Pro. 
Uh, here's another slide uh, that definitely we can share this. Uh, this is public facing, so we can share this with TATI if they'd like to give this out, but you can find all of this information on our website as well. These are more just the text and the specs of what each printer is doing and can do. Um, the Innovent Plus is the one I really like to, to, to highlight here. It's really great for research, prototyping, um, rapid product development, and even, you know, some short run productions. There are customers that have multiples of these machines that matches their capacities or, or, or their volumes. Um, and just to dive a little further on the, on, on the Innovent, it does have the triple action uh, triple ACT technology on it. And why that's so important is, is this is the same technology that's on the 25 Pro and the 160 Pro. So if a customer develops a model and a material on an in event, it's very scalable to larger machines for larger parts or for higher throughput. And really one of the reasons it's so compelling for R&D, universities starting out is because it's the complete open system. So the binders are open, or sorry, the powders are open, the binders are not, but we have a selection of binders for you that will work with those materials, but completely open on materials with a low volume of powder usage. So it can be done by hand and you're not using excessive amounts of powder. Um, what's also nice is all the software is open too. So if you need to, or if you want to get into making different process parameters, we have that those open as well. So it's really important to know that this is the most um, studied machine. It is the most studied process for metal binder jetting is done on this. We have some key references, Virginia Tech, um, El Paso, Pittsburgh's a great partner, and then Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So if you're looking for any of those third party references, we have them. Um, there's also a um, blog on our website showing all of the research papers. You can dive into there. Um, give you a little bit more about what just the whole ecosystem of is with the Innovent system. So it starts with the printer, um, kind of up there at 11 o'clock. Then you're going to be going down to 6 o'clock and using the uh, curing oven, um, the curing step. Then you'd be going up to the blue hooded for the depowdering. And then from the depowdering, you'd be going into the XF1 furnace. Um, and then after that, you'd have your final parts. Um, case studies, and I've got a couple minutes left here, but I, I just want to kind of breeze through this to show you that all of the, re all of the research that was done years ago is now um, bearing fruit and in industry. Uh, one of the first ones is a very uh, high use case in additive manufacturing, which is end effect, end effectors of robots. So this end of arm tooling was supposed to be designed in aluminum, but when the designers were able to design it in 17.4 and add the same type of uh, weight or weight reduction and cost reduction, but increased strength. That was a really great benefit for this application. And these were done on um, on X1 technology, and it really showed the benefits of what could be done with additives. Um, again, another company, a MIM type company. Um, really, what's happening with metal additive manufacturing, especially binder jet, is you're able to do it without a tool, and that's very important to the MIM sector because sometimes some applications don't warrant the volume that a, uh, a making a tool would make. So now they're able to attract the level of customers that need less parts that are more efficiently without a tool. Um, this one's another great green innovation. Uh, we really want to uh, highlight our sustainability. So this one just came out with a company called Cellwise. They are making a metal tool that is porous, that we're able to pull um, wood, wood pulp through at very high temperatures to make non-plastic recyclable uh, material. And cartons and packages and spoons and plates, it's, it's a really, really cool application. Again, all of these can be found on the X1 website. Um, I heard someone question uh, aluminum earlier. Yes, aluminum is a customer-qualified customer material. We have worked with Ford, Ford Motor Company to get 6061 available. Um, we, uh, we do have programs for cu customers that are interested in evaluating aluminum, uh, but this was in a very exciting uh, press release for both X1 and Ford because this was something that was not supposed to be able to be done in uh, binder jetting, but our research scientists were able to figure it out, which is extremely exciting. Um, and just kind of one last slide that, you know, decentralized manufacturing. 
This is just a, a neat slide. We're working with the U.S. Army and the Department of Defense on getting 3D printers um, either in forward operating base or humanity, humanity crises to where that they need metal parts. They could be using a metal design lab or they could be using a binder jetting system, but they could be able to put it in a box and, and drop it wherever they need it and they can get metal parts quickly.